bankruptcy red flag. Uh, today we have Bruce Nathan and David Banger from Lowenstein Sandler here to present. Um, this webinar is hosted by the Federation of Credit and Financial Professionals and Credit Debate. Um, I'd like to now introduce you guys to Bruce and David, and they're going to take away the presentation. Thank you. Hi, this is Bruce Nathan, and uh, Will David and I will kind of be revolving. I'm in my very, very relaxed moment, having done a program this morning on credit insurance for another at ACM group. But let me let me introduce this subject because we got a lot of stuff to cover. This probably will be one of your more valuable subjects because this is the area where you can, if you can pick up the warning signals and quickly react, you have a good chance of minimizing your exposure with a distressed account. Um, what, what's kind of remarkable here is that uh, when you're dealing with a financially troubled customer that's heading towards bankruptcy, bankruptcy that's ultimately filed shouldn't be a surprise. There, there are many warning signals that are out in the market and that predict a bankruptcy to come that are available for you to pick up a year, maybe even longer, before the bankruptcy is filed. This is not something where, uh, in many cases, a bankruptcy should come as a total surprise. And when you factor that into the fact that we're in a lot different world uh, than when I started practicing law in 1981, and I love, I'm sitting beside my colleague David Banker, my partner David Banker, I'm sorry, and we're, we're from two totally different generations. When I started practicing law in 1981, what was emails, uh, websites, they, they were sci-fi. Uh, you know, we made phone calls uh, to find out, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to, to find out information. We actually had to go down to a court and look at paper dockets. Uh, the, the availability of information now is just remarkable. And the point of this program, uh, as we go through, is to identify what are the red flags out there of, uh, of a bankruptcy that may come in a year, a year and a half that you should be looking out for. What, what are the sources of information uh, to find out these red flags? Um, and uh, you know, it's all well and good to talk about uh, information about public companies. How do you find out about your small, you know, small dis financially distressed companies? How can you get information on them? And once you find out uh, that uh, that you have a distressed company, company, and we're not dealing with a situation where you could just simply cut them off because you're working purchase order by purchase order, but let's say you're operating under a, a long-term supply contract purchase order or, or services arrangement. Is there a provision in the contract that gives you the ability to uh, to now change your credit terms to cash in advance? Or what are the legal remedies uh, that are out there uh, to allow you to do that? What security devices can you look to uh, in order to improve the likelihood of payment of your claim? And I'll let David Banker start to talk about some of the red flags uh, on screen, too. Mr. Banker, take it away. Actually, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for allowing us onto um, your computer screens. Um, first, Justin is going to ask a question to the group. I goofed. Sorry about that. Thank you, David. So everyone who's here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a poll question for you. Um, the poll question is, how knowledgeable are you on the topic of bankruptcy uh, warning signs? Uh, the choices are no knowledge, limited knowledge, and average knowledge. Um, if you guys could, please take a second and uh, answer this question. I also wanted to point out to you guys that there is audio information if no one can hear. You just dial into our audio bridge. Uh, it should pop up on the side um, on your main screen here. Um, also, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask those questions in either the question or chat box, and we will also get to those. Uh, we'll take them all, and we're going to save them for the end of the presentation. Um, right now, I'm going to close the polls just so you guys know. And I'm going to share the results. Um, I hope you're sharing so, with the speakers, too. And by the way, Bruce uh, Nathan says, good afternoon and good to see you. I don't think you. that you can see them, Bruce, so I'm going to tell uh, you what the responses are. OK. Um, All right. We have 5% we have of the attendees with no knowledge of bankruptcy, 33% with limited knowledge, 51% with average knowledge and 11% with advanced knowledge. Good. That's a, so, that's a fair, that's a good sample. And, and the good news is even if you don't have a lot of knowledge of bankruptcy, what we're trying to do here is let you get ready for um, 
or get um, warned before the, the debtor ever gets to that point. We want you out and, and not to have a, um, a large claim against these debtors. The first thing that, um, when looking at warning signs, the first thing we suggest that you look at is operational issues impacting your customers. And you might not be able to locate information on every point, especially depending on when it, what information is available and whether, whether the debtor is public or private. But here's a bunch that we think that you should look for. Declining sales, narrowing margins, continuing substantial operating losses and net losses, declining cash flow and declining availability um, under the loan facility, increased reliance on debt to fund operation to fund the operations, failure to invest in, in CapEx and failure to do routine upkeep, weakening competitive position among peers. The, you know, if, if operational not going sorry, speeds aren't moving. Hold on one second. Uh oh, hold on. There we go. Good. Thanks. Um sorry. If if the operational issues exist, um, you may see and you should look for whether the debtor has re requested an increase in its credit line, changed its payment pattern, increased the frequency of post dated um, checks or they're holding checks after cutting them, increased frequency of bounce checks, of course, loss of trade credit from other vendors, distressed companies looking for new vendors because it was cut off by other vendors, or that they're buying more from existing vendors than they were before because they were cut off by other vendors. Now, you should also be on guard when it comes to debtors in troubled or challenged industries. You know, look out for overcapacity in the industry, just a lot of a lot of players, higher raw material costs. A lot of these things you're going to just see in the Wall Street Journal. It's not too hard to locate. Um, changes in consumer tastes and of course declining consumer interest and um, increased competition from low cost competitors, usually foreign, um, who are importing, which can drive down the sales price. You know, and David was talking about kind of the immediate um, uh, warning signals. These are the, start, the, the starting ones. Uh, and now we're getting into warning signals that may explain um, uh, why uh, losses um, become more problematic. To the extent, uh, David mentioned that uh, to the extent that there was an increased reliance on funded debt where the company is losing money, the company cannot just rely on its revenue stream um, to meet its obligations. It has to start borrowing. You know, we're in a very interesting time now. Um, interest rates are at historic lows. And a lot of, the, one of the reasons why we don't have as many bankruptcies or companies failing is uh, that uh, customers that are financially distressed are able to enjoy the benefits of very low interest rates. And th those low interest rates are camouflaging problem accounts. The problem is, is that if there's an upcoming large interest payment or if there's if the if the if there's an upcoming principal payment, or if there's an upcoming maturity of the of the debt, the question is is does the debtor have the cash flow or the availability to be able to pay that? Uh, in a case called New Page, which is a coated paper manufacturer, we're going to talk about New Page a lot here um, because they did file bankruptcy, and we were dealing with warning signals from them a year, a year and a half before the bankruptcy that allowed our client to really take advantage of the situation and reduce their exposure substantially. New page, one of the big concerns the client has is there was upcoming interest payments, upcoming principal payments towards the end of 2011, maturity into 2012. And there was a real question, given that there was total debt, secured debt of something like $3.1 billion, there was a real question as to whether New Page was going to be able to pay all that debt. Um, and that played a large part in, in, in a client's uh, credit decisions where they were operating under a long-term supply contract and they were required to extend 60-day terms. Or you may be dealing with the imminent expiration of a credit of a loan facility uh, or the risk of an upcoming default, uh, whether it's a bond default, a covenant breach. I was uh, talking today to, uh, at a credit group meeting and somebody was showing me a BlackBerry with one of their customers. The, uh, there was a covenant breach. 
uh, in their loan covenants. They breached a financial covenant. And the person asked me, what does this mean? And I said, this means the bank can call a default. And whenever you see uh, information about a covenant breach, you, you, you're asking, is there any sort of forbearance agreement where the bank has agreed not to um, exercise its right to call a default in response to the breach, but to agree to forbear from exercising default rights. They enter into a forbearance agreement. That is not a good thing. Uh, there was a company called Orchard Supply, um, which had a February 2003 SEC filing that reported covenant breach and a forbearance arrangement with its bank. And lo and behold, in June of 2013, that was uh, three months, four months later, uh, Orchard uh, Supply filed Chapter 11. The existence of the covenant breach and forbearance agreement was assigned to a lot of people in the trade for Orchard Supply that there was something wrong with this customer, and many people reacted by being able to change their credit terms. They weren't operating under long-term supply-type contracts. Um, other types of actions that start to happen when, the, when your customer's financial situation gets grave, with David, David's points and the beginning points in terms of the losses um, and the response to that, if you're dealing with a public company or a publicly traded um, debt securities or equity securities, if there is what's called an agency downgrade, a, a downgrade of agency credit ratings to junk status, and those credit rating agencies could be Moody, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch, um, these downgrades to junk status are a very, very helpful uh, gauge in evaluating a distressed company's, company's financial risk. When a company goes down to junk status, there's a substantially increased risk of a bankruptcy filing that will be coming in the coming months. And Orchard Supply, by the way, that was a hard goods retailer on, in California. They were downgraded to junk status October of 2012. And they filed the Chapter 11 June of 2013. And a lot of people took notice in October of 2012. That's when the trade actually contacted us and asked us to watch this. And we watch many of these troubled companies. And a lot of people at that point, between that and the covenant breach in February of 2013, those two warning signals were enough for a number of people to bail, uh, and they ended up minimizing their losses uh, in the orchard brands, in the orchard supply bankruptcy to come. Um, loss of credit insurance, that's another telltale sign. Um, Radio Shack, uh, unbelievable. I've gotten calls from clients about credit insurance being ratcheted back, um, and that's a sign that uh, something is afoot. In, in the uh, Circuit City matter, the Circuit City case, credit insurance was lost a year before the bankruptcy, and that was a sign uh, that Circuit City was going to file, which they eventually did. In Borders, credit insurance was restricted and cut back two years before the bankruptcy was filed. And, and again, at that point, we knew that there was a bankruptcy afoot. And uh, the put market, which is a sort of specialized credit insurance, dealing with financially distressed accounts. Also, for Circuit City and Borders, there was a loss. Uh, uh, the, the market for puts was gone several months, in the case of Borders, a year before the bankruptcy filing. And again, a very telltale sign long before the bankruptcy uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, this company was having troubles. And again, all started with lousy financial results, uh, not investing in CapEx, all those that David laid the foundation, but all this kind of comes home to roost. With, uh, with warning signals that are in response to all those difficult, difficult problems and the, the, required, the resulting over-leverage because of the need to borrow. So let's talk about warning signs getting closer to the bankruptcy. We're moving closer. Uh, there's a delayed SEC filings. Anytime there's a delay in release of financial information, that is not good news. Worst news is if the debtor's financials are restated. In a case called AgFeed, which is a hot, one of the larger hog and pig producers in the world, big operations in China and the U.S., where we represented the creditors committee of the bankruptcy that was filed, they restated their financials in March of 2013. The bankruptcy filing was in July of 2013. The restatements, which were massive, were really an indication that something was very, very wrong here and uh, should have given people some signs that uh, they should that, uh, that that there was a bankruptcy coming several months later, which eventually happened. If if stock prices or bond prices drop, uh, that's also a gauge of the company's uh, failing uh, in, uh, upcoming failure. If there's a going concern, notice in the financial statements where the financials actually say that there is uh, a question as to whether this company is continuing to be a going concern. In Orchard Supply, and I keep using Orchard as an example because they are a real-life warning signal several months before the bankruptcy, a bankruptcy filed in June of 2013. In Orchard Supply, uh, the going concern notice appeared in the financials in December of 2012. And of course, if the 
uh, stock, uh, if, if, if there's a ballistic uh, and, and an ability for the stock to trade on an exchange, also not good. And then as we get closer, um, there are usually leadership issues. That's a telltale sign of leadership changes, particularly the loss of the, C, the chief financial officer. In New Page, the CEO resigned 15 months before the Chapter 11 filing. The CFO resigned five months before the Chapter 11 filing. J.C. Penney, which has had problems recently, has had management turmoil and some, and and and, and a rotating, a revolving door with respect to their CEO position. Uh, there could be members of the board of directors resigning, bailing out, as I think is the best word, and the appointment of new members potentially with with an insolvency background. In in a case called Catalyst, uh, there was a gentleman named Harvey Miller that was added to the board. Now, many of you don't know who Harvey Miller is from a hole in the wall. But in the insolvency community, Harvey Miller is one of the top insolvency professionals in the world. So when Harvey was added to the board, he wasn't added to the board to help Catalyst increase their sales. He wasn't added to the board to, to, to get more customers for them. He was added to the board for his insolvency expertise, and Catalyst was, was a bankruptcy Chapter 11 filer uh, several months later. Um, the, the retention of, of, uh, of certain folks, like a chief restructuring officer, a crisis manager, uh, these, these are the types of people that are usually involved in an upcoming bankruptcy, and they could be hired even before the bankruptcy is filed. Uh, there could be a, a, a bondholder, an unofficial ad hoc bondholder committee of, of companies that's formed. Uh, the announcement uh, or publication that insolvency professionals are retained, and again, this doesn't have to happen one week before a bankruptcy filing. In New Page, one of my favorite cases, uh, financial advisors for New Page were being interviewed almost a year before the bankruptcy was filed. And what's unbelievable is you say, how do people know about this? Hell hath no fury that a financial or a legal professional jilted and not retained. And when they're not retained, who do they usually go to to complain? They go to the press, and the press then reports these stories. In, in Orchard uh, Supply, FTI, which is a well-known financial advisor firm involved in bankruptcy cases, was retained, and it was announced um, four months before the bankruptcy to Chapter 11 was filed. DLA was retained, they're a law firm, to quote, handle the restructuring. Restructuring is always a synonym for a potential bankruptcy to come, and they were retained uh, a few months before the bankruptcy was filed. It was also reported in Orchard that the lender solicited Zolfo, which is another financial advisory firm, very, very heavily involved in the bankruptcy case. As you get closer to bankruptcy reports and negotiations with a prospective Chapter 11 vendor, a lender, excuse me, and then of course the ultimate, ultimately the, the, the imminent threats of bankruptcy. I remember uh, in Delphi uh, there were threats of bankruptcy several months before bankruptcy was filed, and it, that, that information alone was enough for some, some of my clients to bail out and uh, try to reduce their terms. Okay. So uh, we now get to sources of information, and I'll let my, my man Banker now resume. So we've given you a lot of warning signals to look for, but where should you look? Now, number one, it's not even here because it's so obvious, but it should be. It should be in bold-faced, underlined, fluorescent yellow, blinking, but we can't get anything to blink here. Ask the customer. It is amazing the relationship that vendors have with their customers internally, whether or not you know, it's a salesperson with a plant manager. It just is amazing how much information a distressed company or the employees of a distressed, distressed company are willing to give up. And that is your first line of defense. If you can get some inside information um, that suggests that, the debt, that they're having problems, go with it. Learn. Um, next, of course, you can look at other vendors dealing with the customers. And really, the first three bullet points here go hand in hand, which is salespersons in the industry and trade association and credit groups. Talk to, talk to the people that are in your industry. Go to the credit group meetings. Chances are they might have some information about the same people that you're doing business with. Um, next, completely different, talk to claims traders. Talk to credit insurers. Talk to parties selling puts. Chances are if they're willing to um, you know, put their neck out on the line, they're probably, they've probably done a lot of diligence in order to determine whether or not they want to make the investment, whether or not they want to issue credit insurance, whether or not they want to, to sell a put. Um, so we certainly do recommend that even if you don't necessarily want to sell your claim or get insurance, can you hurt to test the waters and make a call? Check it out. See what people know. Same with, the, same with the next bullet point, which is insolvency professionals and turnaround advisors and investment bankers. You know, it's amazing that when parties start to get distressed, 
we start to get calls. Other creditors are calling us. I cannot tell you how many times, first we get a call from one creditor, a few days later another, and it, 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 helps, it helps that we hear it because then we become a source of information and let you know that you're not the only one and that there does appear to be a problem. The, um, next, of course, and this is, these, this is more analytical, you, you, know, you can look at national publications and websites, newspapers, go even deeper and, do, um, and, and, uh, and get free information with regard to lien searches. Um, of course, you can order lien searches and pay for them, but most secretaries of state have a website, and you usually can get at least limited information on what type of liens have been asserted and what kind of UCC filings have been asserted against a, um, a debtor. And it just gives you an idea about how much trouble they might be in. Um, in addition, of course, you can look on court websites if you know what state the, um, the debtor is from and figure out if they've got a lot of pending litigations. Um, SEC filings are public, so if it's a public company, there's a plethora of information, and it's not only with regard to financials that can talk about um, what's happening with stock, what's happening with executives and, and directors, and who's, who's on, who's off. Um, of course, follow, follow their stock prices and see what, what other um, information you can get, the, the commentary that goes along with it on almost every single website that um, follows stock prices. Um, of course, you can do a credit check. Um, you can pull... Several companies will give you credit ratings. And um, finally, the pay services, the distressed debtor reports, there's several companies that this is their job. They, um, they certainly are, are out there, and their sole purpose, and the reason they want you to hire them is because they are going to help you um, know that a company is going downhill before, before anyone else knows. They have many different ways to do it, but they're the ones who do the research for you. One of the, just before we leave the screen though, I gotta tell you that the amount of free information is just remarkable. I'm looking, we're looking at a company in the book publishing industry, very, very large retailer. And what amazed me is last week I'm reading an article, a free article off the Bloomberg website, free. And the article is discussing problems this company is having and risks of a eventual Chapter 11 filing. And what's remarkable to me is this is free from a great source that has incredible value and it doesn't cost anything. The best things in life are free. And that includes bankruptcy warning signals. But sometimes you do have to pay for it. And DebtWire, um, we, we call that an insolvency rag. Uh, it's a gossip magazine. And uh, gossip sometimes, though, has elements of real information. And DebtWire is a very good source of information for us as to who is having financial problems. Uh, a blue chip company does not hit debt wire. Debt wire, if you hit debt wire, you're in trouble. And usually, when we start to get calls from clients, usually it, we're going to see something in debt wire within a few weeks because the clients are the greatest source of information about problems. And when we look at a Best Buy, for example, which started to see financial problems um, going back to 2011, and it's fascinating because David talks about insolvency professionals as a great source of information. The one thing that we insolvency professionals have in common, and I am a very big advocate of it, if you know a little Yiddish, we love to get there. We love to sit down when we have a drink and we go to our conferences. The amount of information that we get from gossip is extraordinary. I'm having a drink with somebody at the, at the Hay Ashbury Hotel at an American Bankruptcy Institute conference at the 2011 ABI Spring Meeting. And, uh, and, and he's yelling and screaming about how uh, you know, Best Buy had engaged their firm to consider, or at least we're interviewing their firm, to consider uh, doing a liquidation of about uh, of several hundred stores. And uh, they were interviewed, and ultimately Best Buy decided to do the liquidation themselves, and they didn't hire this firm. Well, this guy was raving and ranting about what idiots they are and the problems they were having, and it's amazing, but that not, uh, not a week later, we see this article about Best Buy's um, debt uh, spiraling towards junk and all the problems they were having and uh, assigned. I mean, Best Buy hasn't filed Chapter 11 yet. I'm not going to predict that they're going to file. But when they come up with the stories in DebtWire, that's a warning signal uh, that combined with other stuff could be very relevant to you. We've heard a lot about Sears and Kmart. And here's an example, uh, this article discussing the resignation of Sears chief executive officer. And as I said, a CEO resignation, a CFO resignation, a sign uh, that things are not afoot. Well, J.C. Penney, the downgrade of J.C. Penney uh, of their credit ratings to, to a BB minus 
um, is a uh, it, it was was a negative sign. And as we continue to go a little more forward on JC Penney, we're seeing information about them. having credit problems. They're large as their factor. Uh, stopping uh, you know uh, uh, approving credit with respect to their factors their their customers that that are that are shipping to JC Penney, and uh, that's not a good sign. Um, we go further with JC Penney into 2014, and we we see an article about uh, uh, earnings misses, and uh, uh, while the department stores chain um, it, it, it chains liquidity is adequate, it's not ample. At least JC Penney little room for error. Again, it just indicates that something here may be afoot, um, and something that you may want to consider as you're making your credit decisions on them. I, I mentioned Orchard Supply, and this is a perfect example of where all these warning signals did lead to a bankruptcy. And we are going to February of uh, 2013, and remember they filed in uh, June of 2013. And we have a DebtWire article here about the, about the pressure to restructure their balance sheet. Uh, they've been out of compliance with their credit facility leverage test. That was the covenant breach that we talked about. Um, it, it's the, the inking of a second waiver from its term loan lenders, a forbearance arrangement. The retailer already secured a waiver for its covenant trip, covenant trip, a potential breach there back in October uh, of 2012. Uh, we are talking about stuff that's happening six, seven, eight months before the bankruptcy that suggested that something was wrong here with respect to this company, and they eventually filed. Back in February of 2013, Orchard Supply taps FTI. Uh, FTI, financial advisory firm, when FTI gets involved in the case, they are very familiar with bankruptcies. That's one of their tools in their, in their toolkit. And so this suggests that uh, there was a bankruptcy to come, and it actually did come. Um, and another DebtWire article where they expanded their credit facility, they obtained a covenant waiver here, waiver of default. A bank can call a default, chose not to, but that's not necessarily a good thing. When you put all these together, with some other things that were going on with uh, with Orchard Supply, there were a number of vendors that picked up these warning signals and reacted months before the bankruptcy was filed and were able to uh, eliminate a lot of risk. And what's interesting about Orchard and what's interesting about a lot of public companies is you wouldn't think they're a bankruptcy candidate based on the way they paid their trade credit. They, were, they paid their trade credit like clockwork. So you couldn't argue, oh, I'm concerned about me not getting paid on time or competition or competitors of people in my industry getting paid, they paid like clockwork. And yet these warning signals suggested they were a candidate for filing, and months later they ended up filing. Radio Shack is one now that is, hasn't filed, but there's a lot of stuff out there. Talking about closing 500 stores in upcoming months, there were later articles uh, that uh, we didn't include that talked about uh, the possibility of closing a lot more stores than that. There was a Bloomberg article, uh, March of 2014, which talks about Radio Shack results push bond to default zone. Uh, so there's a potential risk of default that's reported uh, in one of the articles that we have. And uh, again, there was another article, Radio Shack details turnaround plans and quarterly conference calls, hires A&G Realty. And again, they were talking in this call about their results, the adverse results that they had. Uh, Radio Shack releases fourth quarter results, this is from 2013, revealing same store sales declined by 19%, plans to close 1,100 stores. This was also in March of 2014. These are not good things. Um, and again, the recent information about, uh, about credit insurance being ratcheted back, another telltale sign. And in July 2013, Radio Shack appointed Holly Entlin as interim CFO. Holly is a partner with Alex Partners. She's a good friend. Um, she's a smart person, but uh, Alex Partners, uh, in terms of exploring restructuring options, looked to bankruptcy as a possible option, and she is their interim CFO. Get the word interim CFO, and Alex Partners is engaged as a consultant. These are not good signs. Um, in addition to, you know, there's one report here that's not pay, and I just threw it into the pay, but frankly, it dovetails with what David said, and maybe what we'll do in the future, David, is we'll put this as part of you know, as part of the free service, there are analyst reports that are out there. J.P. Morgan, a great source of information. They're claims traders, and they also do a lot of analyst work. And if you're a customer of J.P. Morgan, you can get a ton of free information on on from them with respect to all distressed retailers and, and companies in other industries. That's absolutely fantastic. And this analyst report, which is free, 
talks about J.C. Penney's fourth quarter same store sales for cigar estimates modestly lower, but raising a lot of questions about 2014 and liquidity options should sales or margins not pick up. Uh, again, free information. Liquidity is adequate, but not ample. It may need a capital raise or asset sales before August, September. If results don't improve by then, we believe this is likely too tight for vendors' comfort. All of this is incredible free information. Uh, in the distress publications, my apologies, but we thought we'd make sure you're all you know, afoot, uh, because that information from the analysts is free if you have the right context. Um, there are other distress publications like the DBR, the Daily Bankruptcy Review. This report was done in the beginning of 2013, incredibly, incredibly predictive in that it identified four retailers uh, that were financially distressed that are being watched. None of them have filed bankruptcy yet, but uh, it'll be interesting to see over the next two years, you know, if any of them uh, are bankruptcy candidates. And there's a lot of warning signals out there for all of them. Uh, Distressed Company Alert is another publication. December 2012, they raised issues about Reader's Digest uh, uh, credit rating being reduced to junk status and actually being further reduced to junk. Uh, and, and that was December 2012. PS Reader's filed at the beginning of February 2013. Very, very predictive. Uh, and that downgrade was a good indication of problems involving Reader's Digest. You have Deal Pipeline, which, which reports on Navistar, which is trouble, not at bankruptcy, not that they have not filed bankruptcy, but they, when you're reporting, when, when, the, when these companies are being reported on in these publications, it's just something you need to kind of look at as you make your decisions, then you can, assess, you can make your own assessments of, of risk and the likelihood of bankruptcy in the future. There's an old saying in the Nathan family, and I think the banker family and everybody else, when there is smoke, there is fire. And the more of these warning signals that show up, the more likelihood there's fire in a bankruptcy to come. Bloomberg is a great source of information for us. We use the terminal to confirm when bankruptcies are filed. We use the terminal uh, to, uh, to discuss the different types of debt uh, that may be that this company may have, the pricing on the debt, and to the extent uh, this is secured debt and the debt is trading at 100% virtually par, that's a good sign. Um, market is a uh, source of information. It's pay, it's pay. It tracks prices of traded bank and other debt for private companies, this is for private companies, uh, but it's got to be large debt. It's not going to be for the small mom and pop. And if we're seeing secure debt trading at significantly below par, at like 50 to 60 percent of par, that's the market saying that even though the debt is secured, the likelihood is is the secured creditor is only going to realize 50 to 60 percent of its claim. That means it's under water. That means there isn't enough to pay unsecured creditors. That means that the likelihood you're going to be paid is very diminished, and that's a very scary sign for you in terms of looking at your likelihood of getting paid on your claims. Okay, a lot of people ask me, we actually added this to the program a couple of years ago. Oh, Bruce, David, you know, it's all well and good for you to talk about a public, large public company, but I deal with mom and pops. So how do I get information about mom and pops? And that means that you've got to roll up your sleeves and get this information on your own. And to the extent that you're dealing with this customer and you don't have financial information about them, and you start to see some negative information coming out, this happened to a client of mine recently, there is a laundry list of stuff. I would take these next few screens and just put them into a document request. Because if you're concerned about your customer's financial health and you haven't received their financial statements, uh, you should, but if you haven't, you should be asking for their financial statements covering the most recent 12-month period. You'd love to see audited, and if they're not audited, why? Um, and, uh, and, and what is the most recent statement? And, and can you look at internal financials? You want to look at accounts receivable aging, which, by the way, is spelled right here without an E. David and I were debating aging with an E or without an E. Uh, it turns out it's without an E. David was right. Uh, unless, you're in, unless you're in England. That's course. right. Well, I learned I tell you, we in a financial firm really learned something here. Uh, if you have accounts receivable that start to age out, where you've got a large component of your, of your receivables that are old, maybe disputed, uh, other reasons, that's a very bad sign. You're looking for, 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 your, for the projections of the business plan. Do they have a business plan? Do they have projections? How are they doing in relation to the projections that they have? Are there any pending lawsuits? A company called Exide um, had a major litigation in California where California shut down their facility in California because of environmental issues, and that lawsuit pretty much put them into bankruptcy several months later. The existence of pending lawsuits could be a telltale sign of bankruptcy to come. Is, is your customer current on their taxes? If they're not, 
um, and, and uh, you'd want to see recent federal and state returns, th those tax claims could result in liens of being imposed on debtors' assets. Are there any unfunded pension or other contingent liabilities? Are there potential environmental liabilities? Um, you would ask, you know, who, are your, who is your customer's lawyer? And if the law firm that comes up is somebody that Nathan or Banker say, well, we know these people in Missouri. They're not, they don't just practice corporate law. They practice bankruptcy law. That can be an indication as to what you, that your customer is looking to work from a financial angle here towards restructuring insolvency, whether it's bankruptcy or not, we don't know, but it's certainly not a normal situation. Who's their financial advisor? Are they retaining an Alex Park as an FTI, where again, they're more likely to travel in the bankruptcy court? When were they retained? And what role did their lender, their bank, play in the selection process? If the bank is interested in bailing out, the first thing they're going to do is push their customer to retain professionals who the bank feels comfortable with to facilitate a, 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 a sale or a liquidation of their collateral. They will play a major role in that. There's no reason why you can't try to get that information. Okay, you want to get information on your customer's uh, bank. Uh, you want to look at, make sure they've dotted their I's and crossed their T's, and you can do a UCC lien search uh, to get that information. And you know, sometimes these things actually come up with very interesting results. I mean, in a case called Mercury, uh, when we represented clients and we did a search, we found that the banks actually filed a new UCC recently against one of the customer potential companies that, uh, that might be a bankruptcy candidate. And they were an operating company, and the bank actually messed up and did not file a UCC against them, and they were trying to enhance their position. That's a very relevant piece of information to know about. You want to review their loan and security agreement and guarantees, who's guaranteed the debt, any, any of the principal's guarantee, where their motivation is to make sure the bank is paid out. You want to identify the collateral and the extent to which the assets are tied up of the customer and how many tranches of secured debt there is. New Page had two tranches of secured debt. The first lien folks were owed about a billion eight. The second lead folks were owed about a billion three. And if you looked at the financials of this company, you knew that if this liquidated, there was not going to be anything for unsecured. And that's exactly what happened, even though New Page filed Chapter 11 and ultimately reorganized. Unsecured creditors didn't get very much. Uh, they certainly didn't get anything out of the assets of the company. What's the status of the financing? Is there any default? Are there any covenant breaches? Is there any forbearance agreement? Uh, most important question is what is availability? Cash, cash, cash. How much cash do they have? How much availability do they have on their bank line? Is that availability being tapped out? Uh, what's the likelihood? How long will they be able to last on the on their cash plus whatever availability they have on their line of credit? What appraisals do they have of their assets? And just and reviewing those appraisals to make sure that they're real. Uh, in a case we're involved in in Mississippi, um, we saw appraisals which were which showed that the real property and the equipment was worth quadruple the amount of all the debt, only to find out that those appraisals were completely bunk um, and totally unrealistic and unsecured would see a fraction of the value of these properties in the bankruptcy cases. Being able to identify uh, from the work that you're doing in the review whether there are any breach, what covenants, what financial covenants there are, operational covenants, and any breach, and any forbearance agreement with respect to it. Uh, asking about the principles of the company, the offices and directors, uh, are there any loans that the debtor made to them or received from them? Any guarantees uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, that the debtor made of obligations of the of the principals or owners, or any guarantees by the principals of company debt? Any repayments uh, or debt to give this, these folks within the past 12 months, which could be preferences in a bankruptcy case? Um, any stock redemptions or repurchases in the preceding 12 months or more, or dividend payments, which could be fraudulent conveyances? that could be attacked in a bankruptcy. What bonuses were paid within the preceding 12 months? What consulting agreements or employment contracts? Boy, there's a ton of information here to conclude this with uh, if you're hearing that your customer is uh, trying to sell itself. And that the strategy is um, that, uh, hey, put, everything's okay. We're, we're going to do a sale and we'll pay you off. Well, then you might want to ask, is there a teaser? Is there, a, is there something that describes that's that a marketing piece with respect to the company. Who's been solicited? Who's been who signed who has signed confidentiality agreements with respect to the sales? There a data room that describes the uh, that, that has information sufficient for purchases to evaluate this company. What due diligence is being done? Are there any term sheets? Is there an asset purchase agreement being, being negotiated? Has a sale already occurred? All this information is an, if you if you get a fraction of it, 
you are ahead of the game in terms of information flow for a small company that might otherwise be more easily available for a large company. I'm going to cue this to Justin um, for, for something he's going to ask, another survey question. And, and just to add one point, to the extent that this small company is not being forthcoming or is not giving information, that in itself should be a telltale sign that something's going on. Absolutely. Justin. All right, guys, so we're going to do another quick polling question. Um, the question is, how do you normally identify bankruptcy warning signals other than from information directly from the debtor? The choices are SEC filings or other public disclosures, uh, other vendors dealing with the same customer, a trade association or credit group, claims traders and credit insurers, or insolvency professional. So if everyone could just take a minute and vote, that would be great. I'm going to leave the poll open for about another 30 seconds. And uh, Bruce, just while everyone is um, answering the question, we had a question come in about DebtWire. And mm -hmm. someone was wondering if it's a free service or if it's something that has to be paid for. It's a pay. It's a pay publication. Um, and if you, I think if you just Google DebtWire, you should be able to find out you know, how you could subscribe to them. Um, okay, and I'll tell you, there's so, many, there's so many distressed publications out there. They're just one of them. Um, and there, there are probably other ones that are better, but uh, they are they are being used by more and more trade books. Right, right. And for DebtWire, there's both publications, and then there's more, um, you know, it, it, a website also where you can type in companies. Just to be clear, right. regarding the survey questions that Justin asked, one one is missing, which is paid publications. But we wanted to kind of get an idea as to what other things people were focusing on. Yeah, if there's any way for you to chime in on whether you use pay publications where you can email Justin, I would do that because I'd be very curious to see how many of you are using these. This is relatively new. You know, I'm very glad the person who asked about that wire, I was at a CRF Credit Research Foundation forum and a number of questions were asked about that wire and we've been trying to educate the trade about the benefits of distressed publications and uh, they're expensive. And if you ever have a question about a customer that you're concerned about, you could always call us, and we could certainly tell you based on the information sources that we have. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the, this information, together with the public knowledge, is incredible. We're going to be talking about some some devices, and uh, th this information has been very useful in in, in 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 the remedies that we'll talk about. All right, guys. So I've uh, closed the poll here, and I'll give you the results. Uh, we have 20% saying they use SEC filings or other public filings or disclosures. 22% saying they use other vendors dealing with the same customer. 54% saying they use trade association or credit groups. And 4% saying they use claims traders and credit insurers with no one saying they use insolvency professionals. Okay, interesting. Do me a favor, Justin, could you forward all these results to us because I'm going to use this for a future program, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course, this is everyone got to only check one box, so there could be um, multiple. There could actually be multiple. Um, very quickly, we're gonna. I'm gonna introduce this back to David. Well, what does all this mean? I want to try to tie this together now into okay. You have all this information. What the heck do you do with it? Well, it allows you. It facilitates a, a decision, credit decisions that could reduce your risk of loss. If it, if it turns out you're operating on pure PO by PO basis. Um, you could just choose any time to change your terms, uh, either restrict them or go to cash in advance. But what happens if you're operating under a long-term contract for supply of goods or provision of services, a long-term purchase order, and you're obligated to extend credit? And let's say there's no provision in your contract that gives you the out of being able to uh, suspend credit terms. The customer is not in default with you, let's say. Um, but you're still very nervous and you want to do something. Well, there are remedies that you have under the Uniform Commercial Code and under state law that you can use uh, to use it as an excuse, an opportunity to try to restrict your credit terms. And I'll let David start with the right of adequate assurance. David, take it away. Yep. UCC 2609 governs adequate assurance demands for good sellers, not service providers. To get the ball rolling, the creditor who's required to ship on credit under a contract will need um, reasonable grounds for insecurity and then they can demand adequate assurance of performance from the financially distressed debtor contract counterparty. So what we're trying to do here is you, you've got a contract, you're obligated to provide goods, um, however you're concerned that you're not going to get paid for them. So there, you know, there is a remedy, there is a way to potentially not have to do that. And, 
put your put your neck on the line. Yeah. You know, in this adequate assurance demand, the, the, the contract counterparty, the, the creditor, needs to lay out its case, you know, why it has reasonable grounds for insecurity. Now, number one, it can be determined by commercial standards between merchants. Just what you know, in essence, that's the whole point of reasonableness. What what is what does your industry think is reasonable to make you feel insecure? Um, you can look at the customers already past due on accounts with you, or is past due on accounts with other vendors if you're able to get that information. You, know, you can look at um, all those warning signals that we just talked about at the start of this presentation, and those could be part of making your case and laying out why you feel that there's a reasonable ground for insecurity. Um, and you're going to, to be clear, you, are t you really do lay it out in the letter and say, here are the reasons why we, why we have reasonable grounds for insecurity. Um, now, what constitutes adequate assurance of performance? You know, and what must the debtor do in order for the creditor to keep shipping? OK, you can revoke credit terms and switch to cash in advance. Obviously, I'm sure you'd be happy to ship if you're getting paid in advance. The debtor would have to pledge security to you that's unencumbered, to be very clear. They can't, if they're going to pledge something to you that's already um, pledged to a bank, that won't really help you very much. An issue, a letter of credit could get issued in favor of the, of the creditor. Otherwise, if any of those things don't happen, then the creditor will not be required to perform under the contract. Now, just to be clear, once the demand is sent, um, pending receipt of the adequate assurance demand, the creditor can suspend performance under the contract. So what does that mean? You've laid out your case in the letter. You've sent a demand. You haven't gotten a response from the other side. During that interim period, you don't have to, you don't have to ship. You, the debtor needs to respond first. In that interim period, you could switch to cash in advance or negotiate more restricted credit terms, um, which we've had firsthand experience with. Now, well, this activity could cause um, bankruptcy preference risk that you're sending this letter that might prompt older invoices to get paid. Um, and therefore, this payment pressure could invalidate the ordinary course preference defense, which is another seminar we'd love to discuss with you. And which um, we'll be having in a few months. <laughs> yes. Um, the bottom line is take the money. Always take the money. Send the demand. You don't want to get into more into a hole. You'd rather send the demand end up hopefully down the road either getting paid in full or having less exposure than you would have otherwise had. So it's always great to try to protect against preference exposure and to not unduly start pressuring, but there are certain situations where it's better to pressure, get paid, and deal with a preference later and, and defending the preference. Um, the, now, the debtor's failure to provide adequate assurance within a reasonable time not exceeding 30 days results in a repudiation of the contract. So what that means is you send the demand, you laid out your case, if you don't get a response in 30 days, you're out. You don't have to ship. You, under, uh, under the contract, the, the, the debtor failed to do what they had to do, which was provide you adequate assurance. They didn't do it. They had their chance. Um, now, there are two, there's two things you've got to look out for. You have to look out for anything in your contract with, with the debtor that is going to limit your rights to send these types of letters and, um, and stop shipping. Now. On the other hand, if you're negotiating a contract, if you're negotiating that contract and you have leverage, um, you might want to consider putting language in there that specifically says you have a right to stop shipping beyond this just general UCC language. So you know it does it does cut both ways. Now Bruce had a um a, an actual well actually we had a scenario where we dealt with these adequate assurance demands and it was quite effective. Yeah, I I mentioned the new page case and, uh, and and this is one where the client was doing business with a very overly leveraged company, uh, going back to 2009, and they were worried about the company, and uh, they asked us to start watching with them in 2009. And to set the table on this, they were operating under a long-term supply contract. Their terms were 60 days from the customer's receipt of goods, which for all intents and purposes was something like 68, 69, 70 days. Uh, after invoice date, the payments were going to be made. Um, in 2010, they had a claim for goods sold and delivered at any point in time is usually around $8 million, but they had additional risk in that they had $2 million of goods that they had on the water that they, they had agreed to bring into the United States. These are special goods. They could not be sold elsewhere. So the new page decided to go Bahala and, and stop doing business. 
um, we would be stuck with goods that we were not in a position to resell to anybody else. So we had a risk of uh, $10 million of losses here, and there were a lot of warning signs that were popping up. And so finally, by August of 2010, after information, a lot of information about massive losses by this company, uh, in the, the, their losses during the first six months of 2010 tripled to be in excess of $350 million compared to their losses in the first six months of 2009. Their liquidity, we were very concerned about their liquidity and their ability to pay um, our claim towards the end of 2010 into 2011 and 2012. And that prompted us to send a demand for adequate assurance. And we sent this letter and we recited all of the losses and the adverse financial results uh, for this company um, during the year before the letter. We talked about, we raised uh, articles from Bloomberg um, that, uh, that indicated that uh, analysts and investors during a conference call, there was a lot of uh, nervousness during that call. Um, there was a statement that new page bonds fell by the most in almost six months after they posted $174 million second quarter net loss. Bloomberg Business Weekly article in August of 2010 reporting that new page had very thin liquidity cushion in 2011 may prove fatal. And analysts report from ETG New York, free. That's a free report. Um, in fact, all this information so far is free. Uh, on the new page conference call, uh, accounts heard that one of the company's planned asset dispositions was being delayed on account of regulatory issues. And if this sale didn't close, a substantial amount of liquidity that would be needed for this company to survive, there was a risk that they, that, that, that that would not be coming in. Adverse trends in new pages industry, again, including uh, the paper sector's loss of market share to digital media, which was expected to continue. Combine that with the fact that there was a lot of management turnover. Uh, the CEO had resigned within this period. The CFO was going to resign a little bit after this. And we demanded, we said, here, in light of all this information and all the bankruptcy risks, uh, there, were, there, were, there were rumors of bankruptcy that was filed, we demand adequate assurance that you're going to be able to pay us. And in response, uh, New Page came back with a letter that said, don't worry, we're hurt with you and all of our trade. We're solvent, uh, so don't worry about it. And that wasn't acceptable to us. We came back and said in a letter, that is not adequate protection. Uh, we are switching to cash in advance effective XYZ date. Interestingly, uh, that got uh, New Page to sit down and talk to us. The, this demand was almost a, uh, a request that, uh, that, that the customer agree to different trade terms. And after some extensive negotiations in response to this, the exercise of the remedy by our client with our help, um, New Page agreed to reduce credit terms from net 60, and again 60 days from receipt of goods, to net 15 days from date of invoice. So the, ter the credit terms were, were, were sharply restricted. Um, and also notice that 15, that's, that's, a, that, that's within 20 days. Um, and uh, there's a priority claim uh, in bankruptcy, Section 503b9, that gives all good sellers a priority claim with respect to goods that were sold and received within 20 days of bankruptcy. So the feeling is if we're within that 15 days, we have a better chance of having more of our claim within the priority. In addition, we got a $2 million standby letter of credit to cover us from the risk of loss of the goods on the water not being accepted. And we made this LC very broad to cover any non-payment of invoice risk. Um, and at the end of the day, um, New Page did file bankruptcy a year, um, within a year of our exercising these adequate assurance rights. And, uh, and we ended up reducing our exposure from $10 million to a half a billion dollars, doing a lot of business with this company. And that half a million dollars was ultimately paid in, paid in the New Page bankruptcy because we had a valuable supply contract, a very favorable contract for New Page that they assumed uh, in the Chapter 11 that ended up paying our claim. So here's an example, a very big success story of being able to identify a number of warning signals within a year of the bankruptcy filing, using them as a basis for a demand for adequate assurance, and then using that adequate assurance demand as a negotiating point uh, to be able to get our terms restricted uh, from, from that 60 to that 15 and getting letter of credit coverage for a portion of our claim that substantially reduced our exposure. There's also adequate assurance right on the service side, uh, service provider side. David, take it away. Right. Similar to the UCC rights that you see with goods providers, um, there is a mechanism, by, at least in some states, by which um, the providers of service can get adequate assurance um, as well if there is um, 
similar to UCC, re, you know, reasonable grounds um, to believe that you're not going to um, get paid. The um, interestingly, some states have adopted this. It's called the Restatement of Second of Contracts. Other states, while they haven't formally adopted it in the law, they're still willing, based on common law, to accept the fact that you have these rights or service providers have these rights. Um, you know, because conceptually adequate assurance rights under the restatement second of contract is quite similar to the UCC rights, we're not going to go into it in greater detail here, but there's more information in the presentation materials which the organizer is going to provide you that you can take a look at, namely the next two slides that we're going to fly by. No. Now we're going into stoppage of delivery, which I'm Bruce is going to talk about. Okay. And again, on the service on the service side, we've also been successful at exercising stoppage of delivery rights, let, uh, adequate assurance rights. One thing, just to, I should have said this before, when you're dealing with any of these remedies, we strongly recommend that you consult with counsel uh, and not do this on your own, because if you get it wrong, there are potential arguments that you breached your contract uh, with your customer. You did agree to extend credit. You now try to excuse yourself from those terms. And if you're obligated to extend credit terms and you want to get out of it, there's nothing in the contract that allows you to, and you try to exercise these remedies, whether it's as a good supplier or a service provider, you really need to be careful. You really do need to have counsel working with you throughout this process. David talked about adequate assurance rights. Uh, another mechanism for protecting you is the right to stop delivery of goods. And it's either goods in your possession uh, or goods that are that are with a carrier or another agent. Uh, these rights uh, for good sellers uh, arise under the Uniform Commercial Code. They arise either, they, they could be about either the debtor is insolvent, which could be a balance sheet of a liability succeeding assets, or an equitable insolvency where the debtor is failing to pay debts as they come due. Um, it's really, it, it's really the, it, it's one or the other. This is the difference with adequate assurance where that remedy could be exercised even if the customer is not insolvent and even if the customer is not in default because there are two ways of invoking stoppage of delivery. Default, failure to pay, or other defaults, or, or an insolv the, the, the occurrence of an insolvency of your customer. And again, you can exercise this right either by not shipping and switching to cash in advance or stopping delivery of goods that are with a carrier. Uh, if you want to exercise this right under the UCC, you've got to give notice to the carrier or other entity that's holding the goods and to the debtor. Um, and uh, this notice um, should be written. And again, it should be you can do a verbal demand and follow, immediately follow it up with a notice. And uh, in response to that notice, the carrier or the third party it del cannot deliver the goods uh, that are subject to this right to stop delivery. Um, without a risk that they could be breaching their obligations under the UCC and they could be sued. Uh, but at the same time, you as the seller are responsible for any charges of uh, the carrier warehouse to the extent they're holding goods uh, that, uh, that are not subject to release. Because at the end of the day, when goods are stopped, what you, what's going to happen is the carrier agent, they're not going to release the goods to your customer, but at the same time, they're not going to release the goods to you because they're kind of between the proverbial rock and a hard place where if they release the goods to you, their customer can, breach, can sue them for breach of their agreement to ship the goods or for other obligations. And if they release the goods to the customer, the seller can say you're breaching the obligation uh, to hold these goods up and stop delivery in response to a valid stoppage of delivery demand. This right to stop delivery is cut off based on the debtor's either actual or, or constructive type receipt of the goods. Either they got the goods, the debtor actually got them in their facility, or uh, the goods are being held by the debtor's agent or warehouse, and the warehouse acknowledges they're holding the goods for the debtor. Or the goods are with a carrier who's acknowledging that they're holding the goods for the debtor by reshipping those goods, although a drop ship may still satisfy, may, they still may not be received in a drop ship situation. Uh, or if, the, if, the, if, the, if you're dealing with negotiable documents of title, uh, the seller's endorsement to the debtor of a negotiable bill of lading. These stoppage of delivery rights are not impacted if title passes, risk of loss passes, even if your customer has engaged the carrier or other agent. Uh, you still have the right to stop delivery until the customer has actually, or in some constructive sort of way, received the goods. The, the beauty of stoppage of delivery is these rights, trade credit, these rights are superior to a secured lender with a blanket lien and inventory, and that, that'll be in contrast to when David talks about reclamation, uh, which is subject to a subordinate to it usually wiped out by existing security interests and blanket liens and inventory. Um, 
after a bankruptcy, you could still exercise the right to stop delivery. That's not precluded by the automatic stay. Um, the debtor is usually going to end up paying for the goods, but you, you, if, you're, if you exercise the right to stop delivery and you want the goods back, you do have to go to court and seek relief from the bankruptcy stay that arises on a bankruptcy filing to get it back. I love a story here, and I'm going to tell a quick story. Um, David and I were involved in a case called SP Newsprint. We were representing a client. They had about uh, $400,000 of goods that were with, that were with the carrier, and they were holding significant amounts of goods. They had a supply contract obligated them to extend 30-day terms, and there was real concern that this customer didn't have sufficient sums to pay any pay for any credit that was extended in the bankruptcy. The client stopped delivery of goods on our instruction. They got a call from debtor's counsel saying, you violated the automatic stay from exercising the stoppage of delivery right. Uh, the client did the right thing. They, they referred the call to us. We called debtor's counsel back, and we said, the right to stop delivery is not affected by a bankruptcy. It's not affected by the automatic stay. Here are the cases. And by the way, we wrote a book on the subject. I'll send you a free copy of our book. Read the book. And if you have an issue, call us back, and we'll go to court and seek to, get, and seek to exercise these rights. P.S. David, as I recall, we never heard from them again. Uh, our client was able to exercise their right to stop delivery of about 400,000 of goods with a carrier. They got paid for those goods. The client switched their terms to cash in advance on goods they were selling to the Chapter 11 debtor. And the great thing for the client is they had a several million dollar obligation. Their contract was assumed in the bankruptcy case. The debtor assumed the contract. That's for another program, unfortunately. And they paid this creditor as full as they were required to do. So it was an absolute win-win situation, all because the creditor exercised the right to stop delivery. The last remedy is reclamation. David, take it away, and then we'll talk about other security devices. See, reclamation is um, a real problem. So we're not going to talk about why reclamation. We're going to talk about why not to use reclamation. Um, now, first, the requirements for reclamation is a, a, a creditor first must be extending credit terms. Obviously, if you did cash in advance, you wouldn't be owed money, presumably, and you wouldn't need to reclaim your goods. Now, the debtor must be insolvent. The, now, when you look at insolvency, there's two ways to look at, look at it, and you could look at it either way. There's the balance, simply the balance sheet method that liabilities exceed assets, or the equitable definition, namely that, debtor not, cannot, namely that the debtor cannot pay their debts as they come due. Now, you know, there's, there, there are additional um, you know, reclamation requirements when you're um, sending the demand. The, the demand must describe the goods. In state law, it must be sent within 10 days of the, of, the, of the debtor's, the demand must be sent within 10 days of the debtor receiving the goods, or else you can't reclaim them. That's a lot different than the bankruptcy reclamation, which has a 45-day look back. Now, keep in mind, um, we're going to give you a lot of reasons why reclamation rights usually don't work anyway, so don't get excited about the 45-day look back in bankruptcy. Um, now, number one, regarding the 10-day look back under a state law reclamation demand, there is one exception when you could look back further, and that's if a debtor in writing misrepresented their solvency. So namely that they said they were um, solvent when they were really insolvent, and they did so in writing. Now, there are a number of defenses that blow up reclamation rights, um, but before we even go into the defenses, this reclamation rights all hinge on there not being a prior floating inventory lien on the, on the assets that you're seeking to reclaim. If there's a bank in there and they have a um, lien on inventory, namely what you ship to the debtor, um, there's a good possibility that your reclamation rights are going to be eliminated unless for some reason the bank is um, actually well um, above water. Now, but let's just assume that a debtor doesn't have a secured lender who has a lien on inventory. There are still other defenses that you're going to have to contend with, namely that um, if the goods were already sold, um, by the time you send your demand, too late. If the goods were processed, um, namely that they weren't identifiable, identifiable at the time of demand, you're too late. And finally, um, you know, namely if, if you have a, um, for example, if you have a compound that goes into um, paint and it gets mixed in already, it's processed, it's too late, you can't pull it out. Same with goods commingled. If your stuff is getting put in a silo with other people's stuff, too late to seek reclamation. Now. But like we said, this, but the real problem is that if there's a prior floating lien, you're um, going to be in trouble. Now, with regards to remedies, and I'm going to do this quickly because we have a limited amount of time, but 
what you would have to do in order to enforce your reclamation rights is, is just several steps and it's expensive and um, chances are um, unless there is a unless there's no prior floating lien um, you're going to probably be in trouble now number one remedy obviously you want to seek return of the goods what are you going to do you're going to go into state court and it's a replevin action it's seeking to turn over your goods it's what in essence what it is seeking injunctive relief so you're not going in and suing for damages you're suing to have your goods returned to you now number huge problem is if you have and we had this problem actually is if you have the goods located in multiple states because in order to do a turnover action a replevin action um, you need to go to the loc you need to sue in the court where the goods are located so if you have goods located in warehouses all over the country you're going to have to get local counsel all over the country to, to file individual actions against the um, against this debtor to turn over the goods it ain't and keep and if there is a and if there is a bank involved who has lien on inventory, you're going to have to join them in the action. So you can expect that they're going to get pretty upset and probably be opposing each of these actions. Now, on top of that, if that wasn't bad enough, some states require you to post a bond. To the extent that you were wrong and you shouldn't have sought those, rec those reclamation rights, for example, because there was a prior lender, the, um, you might end up not only posting the bond but losing the money. Um, which obviously is never a good thing because then you're even in more of a hole. Um, now, before we move on to the next subject, um, Justin is going to um, ask another question to the group. All right, everyone. So uh, this is another question. This is uh, sort of an introduction for the next topic that we have. Um, so besides SEC agreements or UCC filings, what is the most commonly used security device? Uh, the options are letter of credit, guarantees, set off or credit insurance input agreement. Um, if everyone could just take a minute and vote, that would be great. And um, as I said, we've had some questions come in, but if anyone does have any questions, feel free to put them into either the question or chat function, and I will take them all, and we'll do a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And uh, we're going to look to run until about 3.30, but after you guys um, log out and are done with the webinar, we run a survey at the end. It's a really big help for us to sort of get some feedback on everything that you liked and that you didn't like and that we can do to improve our webinars moving forward. Um, so with that, I'm going to close the poll here, and I'll share the results. Um, so we have 39% of people saying that letter of credit is their most commonly used security device. 40% say guarantees. 3% say set off and 18% say credit insurance input agreement. Excellent. You know what? Always educational because I can tell you, I go to sessions, do sessions where people say, LCs, what are you talking about LCs for, Bruce? Absolutely irrelevant to us. And, uh, and, and yet, in this session, a large number, and I think that's very gratifying to hear. Also, let me just clarify, uh, we will be available for questions even after 3.30. You can pretty much email either Banker or Nathan um, free of charge forever on any questions you have. We gave you a lot of stuff, and if you want to email a question later, tomorrow, in the future, or call us, we are always around. Let me, let me start on the security devices, and we have only about five, six, to seven minutes to go through them. And really, the point is, is that if you demand adequate assurance and you don't get adequate assurance, there are a lot of different devices that you can use to protect yourself. Some are consensual with your customer, some are not. The grant of a security interest is something your client, your customer has to agree to. It requires uh, a security agreement that's signed by your customer describing the collateral by category, accounts, inventory, machinery, equipment, general intangibles. You got to get the name of your customer right, and you want to identify that correct legal name. That becomes critical uh, for a UCC filing to perfect the security interest. In the, it's now easier to verify the Secretary of State offices where if you're dealing with a corporation or a limited liability company, have this information and you should be able to get it online in many states. But confirming also that the signer is authorized to sign this agreement, all of these uh, are, are requirements to get a good Article 9 security interest. But in order to protect yourself as against the world, other secured parties, a bankruptcy trustee, um, you got to file, usually file a UCC financing statement. It doesn't have to be signed by your customer. It's authorized by the signing of the security agreement describing the collateral. It's got to be filed in the debtor's correct legal name. Otherwise, if, if a search doesn't uncover it using the debtor's correct legal name, the UCC filing is useless and you're not perfected. 
So you're concerned about getting the name right and verifying it, and also making sure that name hasn't changed uh, over the course of time. And the collateral description has to be consistent with the description of collateral in the UCC. You file in the security agreement. You file the UCC in the state where the debtor is located. It's a lot easier now than in the past. That's usually the, for a corporation or an LLC. Uh, it's the state of registration. If it's a partnership, like a, a registered entity, like a general partnership, it's the state of the principal place of business. If you're dealing with a mom and pop sole proprietorship, it's the state of residence for the sole proprietor. And sometimes you also want to do the state uh, where the sole proprietorship is located. It's usually with the Department of State, but check there are a few states that have local filing requirements. You could also have a purchase money security interest, which has priority. This is a security interest in the goods you sell on credit, where if you satisfy certain requirements, of the UCC, you will get priority over prior uh, perfected security interest in the same assets. It requires a signed security agreement, a UCC filing before the debtor receives the goods, and a notice to all prior secured lenders, creditors with a lien inventory, uh, that you have a purchase money security interest, and this is good for five years. Banker, set off. We're going fast. Yep. Yeah, set off is the right of a creditor to, to credit the amount it's owed to the debtor against any amount the debtor owed the creditor. Now. What we're trying to do is just avoid the absurd and unfair result of making A pay B when B owes A. So, you know, and, and it is a very good device to use when a creditor is, is feels that they're going to get burned and, it, in fact, is um, the debtor is delinquent. Now, you know, so you don't need to see court intervention for starters, which, which, which is very helpful. You can just implement this, um, uh, effectuate the set off. Now, we, we gave examples, but in light of our time constraints um, and the fact that it is pretty easy, an easy concept, we're not going to go through the specific examples. Um, but just to be clear, set off the state law right. It's allowed in every state which, and which may be asserted when the following facts exist. This is what you want to know to make sure you don't improperly effectuate a set off which could create problems down the road. Now, number one, when you're setting off, you must be setting off against debtor property. Now, that means it can't be money that a third party owes you or that you know, somehow through the debtor. It's the debtor owes you money, you owe the debtor money. Now, obviously there needs to be an existing indebtedness. If the debtor doesn't owe you money, it's going to be pretty hard to set off. Now, finally, there needs to be what's called mutuality um, of the obligation between the debtor and the creditor. Now, it's simply A must owe B, B must owe A. It can't be A owes B and B owes an affiliate of A. That's not a straight set off. Now, um, the, th that, it does certainly open up a whole other um, can of worms because it's what's called triangular set off. And in the context, when you have a third party, even when it's contracted that way where a debtor says, look, we're going to agree in this agreement that if the creditor is going to um, say, we're going to agree in the agreement that we owe the debtor money, but the debtor's third party, the debtor's affiliate owes us money, but we can tr do a triangular set off. Sounds great. Look, we've got a contract that says we can do it. In the context of a bank, at least in bankruptcy decisions, we've seen that a triangular set-off has been, um, in more than one occasion, invalidated. So it, there are other ways. There are other ways to deal with setting up a triangular set-off to let's say increase your odds of not getting it shot down. But it, it is. It can be dangerous. Now, next thing is with regard to um, bankruptcy. If you're going to assert set-off rights in a bankruptcy, you want to be careful. It's belt and suspenders, but you're going to want to seek relief from the automatic stay um, in bankruptcy court before effectuating the set-off so that down the road someone can't say that you improperly effectuated the set-off. And violating, to the extent you don't know bankruptcy, violating the automatic stay is not a good thing and you can end up getting penalized. The automatic stay, just to be clear for anyone who's not familiar with bankruptcy, is just saying that you can't go after a debtor's property after they file bankruptcy unless you seek permission first. Okay. Another device that, again, the debtor uh, needs to, this is something the debtor needs to obtain, is a letter of credit. And this is essentially a three-party arrangement where you have your contract with your customer to sell goods or provide services. You're not happy about just accepting credit terms, so you're looking to your customer to go to its bank and get a letter of credit in your favor and the bank will agree to issue the letter of credit in exchange for the customer's obligation to reimburse the bank uh, for any payments it makes on the letter of credit and secures that obligation. And the third contract is the letter of credit itself between the issuing bank 
and the letter of credit beneficiary, which says that if the beneficiary presents all the documents required under the letter of credit and they comply, uh, the bank uh, is required to pay. And again, this could be, we're talking about either a documentary letter of credit, which is essentially uh, the vehicle for payment of the claim, and more importantly, from your perspective, the standby letter of credit, where you essentially look to your customer for payment, and if they don't pay, then you look to the bank for payment by the presentation of documents, just stating that the customer is in default of its obligation to you, and then the bank has to pay. That gets us to guarantees, David. Yep. Um, obviously, everyone knows what a guarantee is, and it really is a, a good backstop, as it's another pot to look into for payment, um, and therefore increases the likelihood um, of payment of your claim. Just keep in mind there's, um, there's more than one type of guarantee, and you want to make sure to get the right one. Um, namely, there's, there's a guarantee of payment. That's good. You're going to get paid. A guarantee of collection, not so good, because that means that the creditor must exhaust its collection efforts against the customer prior to going against the guarantor. You're going to want to be able to go after the guarantor as early as possible, because there's always that possibility that if the debtor's got, having a problem, the guarantor might be having a problem, too. So the sooner you can get go after them, the better. Now, just keep in mind, when you're dealing with guarantees, they sound great, but if you're dealing with a non-credit-worthy guarantor, it's not really, you know, it's not worth the paper it's written on. So try to, you know, do your homework up front and make sure that you're getting a guarantor on the hook that actually has um, assets and um, the ability to pay you if the debtor defaults. And, you know, the last thing, and I'm great, we're really actually right on time, which is gratifying. We actually planned this program, but we got it timed right. The final itch, uh, documents or devices are devices you can purchase. You got to pay for them, but you can purchase them. A credit insurance policy insures in the customer's most valuable, uh, your customer's most valuable asset, uh, is the receivables that are owing to you, and uh, it insures against uh, the debtor, your customer's insolvency uh, in being unable to pay because they're the subject of an insolvency proceeding. It could be a protracted payment default as long as it's not a default arising from a dispute. Um, and, uh, and essentially, as long as you comply with the requirements of the policy, uh, that means you put in your claim on time, you're covered for the particular loss uh, that you're seeking to obtain, um, and you put in your claim, um, you should be paid by the credit insurer. But again, uh, that's oversimplifying. You really need to review that policy, and you need to make sure it covers the risks that you're concerned about, and that uh, you're able to put in a claim um, and not have uh, denial of coverage based upon your failure to comply with the terms of the insurance policy. And of course, you're limited in coverage to the amount uh, that your uh, that that uh, the the policy covers. And then the, you're not you're not covered usually for the whole uh, risk of loss. Usually, there's a deductible that you've got to pay first that's out of your pocket, and then a coinsurance where you share with the insurance company. And uh, and and uh, it, you need, to, you need to make sure you comply with all of those requirements. But again, this is a third-party backstop that you could actually pay for and get. The premium for credit insurance is a lot cheaper. Credit insurance could, usually covers all of your receivables or a discrete part of your receivables. Uh, a put agreement is, is, is a sort of credit insurance with respect to a, a distressed customer or distressed customers. It's an agreement by the buyer to buy the claim in the future at an agreed-upon price, which could be 100% of the claim or less. It does protect against the, the, the customer's default of bankruptcy filing. Usually bankruptcy or insolvency risk is what it covers. And uh, the problem with puts are they are very, very expensive. They can, be, they can cost you 3% a month on the receivables being insured, and it's usually far shorter in terms of duration than a credit insurance policy, which could be a year or more. Uh, but that wraps us up I, with, with, respect to the, uh, uh, with respect to security devices. So Justin, I think if you want to open it up for questions, we're here. Sure, Bruce. Uh, we have a qu couple of questions that came in already during the presentation. Um, the first one is, aren't payments received that is secured with a letter of credit still subject to preference? Oh, I love those questions. Um, first of all, just for benefit, um, David, why don't you just give a quick definition of preferences? Give us a quick definition oh, of preferences. A, a quick definition of preferences simply is that payments that are made within 90 days of um, the debtor's bankruptcy filing are, are potentially avoidable, meaning they can be clawed back um, to the extent that the creditor ends, got a payment that would have been better than they got in the hypothetical Chapter 7 bankruptcy, meaning if a debtor liquidates in bankruptcy, you would have gotten X distribution, but you got paid within 90 days of the bankruptcy and you got a better distribution. 
there's a number of defenses that we're not going to go into today. But one of the elements of a preference claim is you're being paid from property of the debtor. If you are being paid from drawing on a standby letter of credit, for example, we even a documentary letter of credit, you drew within 90 days of the bankruptcy filing, you are not drawing from property of the debtor, you're drawing from third-party property, from the bank. And to the extent the bank pays you within 90 days, uh, there's no preference risk. You can even get paid on the letter of credit after the bankruptcy filing, notwithstanding the automatic stay, because again, you're being paid not from property of the debtor, which is subject to the stay, you're being paid from third-party property. It gets a little complicated if your LC is issued within 90 days, it's a standby, it secures old debt, but if you're talking about a letter of credit that was issued more than 90 days before the bankruptcy filing, absolutely no preference risk. Very, very rare that I could say absolutely. That's an absolute. Okay, great. Um, I've had a couple questions on this. I just want to let everyone know that we will be sending out a PDF of the presentation later this week, and we also have recorded the presentation, so if anyone would like to go back and look at it or listen to it again, that will be up on our website. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to send them in now, and we'll get to them. Uh, Bruce, another question is, is there a format letter or verbiage for adequate assurance rights for a creditor to send to a customer? Um, we can send you verbiage. From, it's like a boilerplate form. The problem is, and this is why you do need to consult with counsel, every adequate assurance letter is different because it depends on the warning signals that you have. So that if, it, you know, like in the new page case, there were very adverse financial results. Uh, there were lots of articles suggesting uh, the company's financial distress, uh, suggesting a bankruptcy risk. The CEO resigned um, within, you know, right before, and there was a lot of management turmoil. And that, that, was, that was new page. Uh, we, we, we could do one for another company, and it could be a totally different, uh, an upcoming principal or interest payment concerned that liquidity, it wasn't sufficient liquidity to pay it. But that, that new page. Uh, another company can have their own unique issues. So, yeah, we can actually send you, if, if the person sends me an email, I can send them a form of letter that we use in some of our presentations. But my warning to you is it's not the form that you use for every case because every case has its own warning signals, and it's the warning signals uh, uh, for imminent bankruptcy that you need to cite in support of, uh, of uh, seeking adequate assurance. Obviously, if you're not getting paid on time, that's easy. Uh, but if you are being paid currently and the, your customer is not in default with you or with other people, uh, you know, you, you're looking to these red flags, uh, and every case is different. So I could send the form of letter as an example, but it's not what you're going to copy in every case. I hope that answers it. All right, great. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, but I want to leave it up for a, uh, a couple more minutes just in case anyone does have any last-minute questions. Um, I'll mention again that when you guys do log out of GoToWebinar that we do have a survey and we would really appreciate it if you would take the time. It takes about 30 seconds to fill out if that. Um, and we get a lot out of it and we really appreciate it when we're uh, trying to continue to make our webinars better and better. By the way, if anybody, if anybody is interested in the book that I mentioned, which is a trade creditor remedy manual, and uh, it has a lot of the remedies that we discussed today, it really does cover some of the information that we discussed today. If you send us an email, uh, we'd be happy to send you that manual at no charge. And again, that's a benefit for credit to be and, uh, at Federation, and uh, uh, we'd love to do that. So again, if anyone wants one, all the price of getting it is just sending us your contact information, and it'll be shot out in the mail. Um, Bruce, why don't you uh, turn it to the slide that has your contact information on it right now in case they want to Oh, we go right to the beginning. Ah, here we go. Oh, I put one at the end, Bruce. No, that doesn't really, uh, that's a bio, but it's no, I don't know if there's any contact information on it. And I think the front screen is the best source of information. The bio is right. great for information, but I don't think it has our e email address and contact information. So it's right in the front. If it's in the back, right. I apologize. One way or another, you should be able to contact us and we'd be happy to provide you with the book or anything else you're looking for. You know, what, what makes this program very interesting, in a credit congress, there's going to be three of these programs held, and the one that I'm doing with Al Carmenini is going to be the most interesting because Al is a credit risk monitor, and they are a great source of financial information. A lot of the warning signals, they're going to be able to provide that information to you if you are a subscriber, and, and we're going to do a program together where we're essentially going to combine 
um, all the stuff we have with their database and information uh, to be able to come up with a lot of interesting up-to-date examples. So if anybody is a credit card risk, I urge you, it would be a good follow-up to this program to attend the, the program that Nathan and Carmen are doing Wednesday, June 11th. Um, and by the way, if anybody is attending Credit Congress on this phone call and you would like to be invited to our dinner, we're throwing a dinner. I'm, I'm, like, I'm throwing, since you gave me time, I'll extend the invitation. Mm -hmm. Free. We have a dinner the night of uh, June, um, I think it's June Sunday 8th. night. Sunday night, June 8th, I believe. And so if any of the credit manager professional attendees, any credit professional, just give us an email, Holla, we'd love to invite you. Um, and again, if anyone has any other questions on any subjects, uh, be it this one or others, we are always available to talk free of charge, no charge, off the clock. Uh, Bruce and David, we had another question come in. Good. Uh, what I if know if I slammed enough, we'd have one. <laughs> <laughs> what if an LC was created within the 90 days but for goods to be shipped? Preference. I love it. Whoever asks that question, send me an email, and, and David and I buy you a drink. It's an excellent question. I, I was waiting for somebody to do that. If the LC is issued, and remember, I expressed some concerns about a standby letter of credit issued within 90 days to backstop old debt. If that LC is secured by debtor assets, it's almost like you're taking collateral within 90 days, and if you're securing yourself within 90 days on old debt, that could be a potential preference in that it satisfies the requirements for a preference. To the extent that you're getting that standby LC within 90 days, but it's securing all future shipments or future provisions of services, we, we have something called the new value defense to preference claim that reduces the exposure dollar for dollar by any new credit that's extended. So if you have an LC for $50,000 and you've extended credit of $50,000 after that LC, even though the LC was issued within 90 days, even though the LC is backstopped by debtor assets, you're cool. It'd be no different than if you took a deposit or collateral of the debtor within 90 days and then shipped after that collateral was granted. Great question. Great question. The person gets a drink. Free. Just email us. Other questions? This was fabulous. And by the way, uh, Banker always says, thank you for joining us. I have the honor to say, after 90 minutes, thank you for staying with us. This was an incredible, incredible program, and the turnout was wonderful. We are looking forward to the next program we're doing for Federation in June, I believe. I think it's June, uh, the week of June 17, 18. You probably know it better than me, Justin. Um, and we're going to be doing a program on preferences. David and I will be doing that program. And if you think this one's wired, wait till you get to preferences. We really get wired for that one. <laughs> so we look forward to seeing you for that program. But we hope to hear from you and talk to you in between. And Justin, any other questions? Because I think we're just about at 3.30. Nope, that's it. So uh, with that being said, I'd like to thank uh, David and Bruce for taking their time out to present to us today and thank all of the webinar participants for taking their time to listen to us. Um, like they said, if you have any questions for David or Bruce, reach out to them directly. And if you have any questions about the Federation of Credit or Credit to Be, you can feel free to reach out to myself directly. And with that being said, I'd like to thank you again and hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us.